Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. Welcome back into the JB and Steel show as we're here to give you the latest and the greatest in the MLB, NHL, NFL, and also some talk on the top statistical people in the NBA at the quarter ish mark. It's just like the NFL or NHL, excuse me. They're in between the 25 to 30 games for each team. Uh, we really appreciate you all for joining. Please subscribe to Steel's channel, who does great all sports coverage here at the Steel Flyers All Sports Network and Steel Flyers on YouTube. And the mind over at Sports Fanatic News, where we do the same, and obviously to peer look wisdom and off the wall hockey, as well as Peyton on the radio. So And Hockey let's Writers Inc. And Hockey <laughs> Writers Inc. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Well, that's on your channel, though. So if they subscribe to your channel, they're going to have Hockey Writers Inc. Lance oh, yeah, they get that too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And have his own channel. I was saying everybody that has their own. Okay, yeah. I got you. All right, I got you. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, man. But um, man, really excited for the JB and Steel version four. Right, we're on volume four. Right, and I see your holiday uh, beverage cup there. We're getting closer and closer to Christmas. Right, have you gotten your Christmas shopping done? No, not all. Right, yeah, me neither. Yeah, no, 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 not even close. Well, I started last night. Okay, now see, I'm lucky because I have relatives that live out of state. So all I have to do is just let my fingers do the walking and I can very easily shop for relatives that live out of state. So that's kind of cheating. So that's kind of cheating. But we we have probably a shopping list or a wish list, Christmas wish list for some of our teams, too, I imagine. Right. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, I would believe so. That would be more so. Um, when it probably comes to the hockey world that we'll get into. But yeah. when it comes to baseball, since we'll do a quick couple-minute overview of it, um, one, Verlander's deal got finalized after the initial lang- language excuse me, had to be corrected and reviewed by the commissioner's office since it came in prior to the lockout kicking in. Is, so are we at, is today, today or yesterday the date? That they that that guys had to be signed before. No, or... that was December second. At oh, like, okay, okay. Yes, yeah, so it was a while ago. Now it was as soon as December, as soon as December first kicked into December second at midnight. Okay, that's when. But yeah, that's that... when the lockout happened, though, too. Yeah, yeah, but there was just a <clears throat> language um hold up in the language of the contract, like the fine print, basically where they had to get that sorted out. But since it's submitted before, it's kind of like when trades are submitted before the trade deadline, and then it takes an hour for them to get finalized, it's still effective because it was before the trade deadline. Okay, so just because you you you, you got it mailed in time to get the postmark exactly. at, at the right time, it just might take a couple of weeks before yeah, you actually so get the judgment. Still effective with the past. <laughs> okay, I got you. So that feels still effective from – what the past CBA had as a structure. All right. Well, I think um, that's cool then. So, but what as it comes to CBA, that's a good transition um, because the MLB, I feel like the lockout is more, the owners obviously still want more of the cream of the crop because the MLB is the one that you see some of the highest salaries. But Jim Salisbury pointed it out. You see some of the highest salaries mixed in in baseball because you have the luxury tax of teams can just go over that. And it's whoever's the richest is basically has the chance to get the, um, both guys. So like, I feel like he mentioned though, a key point, the salaries for other guys though, is in overall baseball is actually dropping for the average Joe, where for the obviously the Tatises of the world, the Wander Francos that get paid young in their career that are phenoms that, yeah, they're going to Mike Trout Harper. Those guys are going to get paid. But the average baseball, like those salaries are actually dropping where that's why the players are probably saying, well, wait a minute, just because the great guys are getting paid all this ridiculous money, I would like a little bit more than just what with this little one to one yearly, like I get a one year deal here, one year deal. Like I would like to have a little bit more. Plus, another thing players are big on is they want to get to free agency quicker rather than having so many years of arbitration. I can't remember the exact number it is, but it's a lot in baseball where they want to be able to get to the free agency quicker. They also want to be able to have the active years, like which is basically how they get to the free agency quicker when they get called up, get activated quicker. Um, so we'll have to see how that goes. That's just some of the things involved. But I think we all knew the lockout was looming when they could barely yeah. 
back the COVID season and get together with that. I mean, really? I mean, I think the big thing is, as a commissioner with Rob Manfred, obviously I detest how Gary Bettman dealt with the um, Blackhawk situation. We'll just leave it at that. But that was not a good handling of the Blackhawk situation. Um, where the um, way, though, that we were able to, with the CBA, have that extended in COVID, he, that's the thing he sucks at. Like, let's just be honest. The thing he flat out sucks at is getting a CBA deal done. We've been in a couple lockouts with Bettman, but he's rose the money share. He's helped expend the game uh, overseas. When I've looked at the numbers, the league uh, doubled and stuff, and then he really has helped yeah. the a level connections at the ECHL level to help with affiliations. Like He's helped the game in a much different way, but he hasn't dealt with certain issues when it comes to PR, like big issues well, like the Blackhawk situation. Um, but Right, and then he, see where – like in the baseball, Manfred has not dealt very well with the exactly. CBA. That's, that's that's where I was going. Like he he hasn't got even when they were able to have that happening now in a more normal world. It's still not normal yet, but a more normal world it happens like, more often. Yeah, you you had that done in a time of high stretch in the NHL. They couldn't even get it done here. Where on the commissioner, it's your job to kind of help pull people together. And they weren't able to do that. But at the same time, on the Players Association and Tony Clark, it's your job to kind of be able to pull that group together so everybody's not just completely at heads with each other. And that's just not going to get anybody anywhere. Where hopefully by the end of January, that's the key date. Because in the beginning of February is when people want to really start reporting. That's when you're able to get this done at the latest. Then you're going to have to sign people. You're going to see people signing like that. But Well, right. Um that are left in the market and there's still a lot of good people like Trevor Story at shortstop to name one. So you're going to end callers Correa at shortstop. So you're going to um, need to get it done sooner. I would hope by more the middle of January. So there's not as quick of a high stress time for baseball managers to have to like sign all this. Yeah. So that would be a better thing, but the winter meetings ain't happening this year because obviously uh, there haven't been, um, the, a CBA deal yet, so unless that gets done in a split second, there's not going to be the winter meetings that normally happen in December. And then also the Rule 5 draft did still happen where um, people select players from the Rule 5 draft from other organizations where they were not able to protect their players, and those players have to be kept up in the bigs. Otherwise, they have to be offered back to their team if they don't make the active roster their previous team. Okay, okay. So – do you think that there's any there's any way that they're going to be able to get this done by the middle of January? I mean, do you I mean, I, I really feel that them not doing the winter meetings is actually hindering the the uh, progress of the CBA. Do you know well, what I mean? The winter meetings are more. They talk about league stuff, but that's also right. where a lot of people get the, the the details and get talks going for trades and all that. And okay. That's, okay. So like they they uh, I don't think they can have the winter meetings without a CBA. So okay, okay. Uh, I but, wasn't sure because sometimes uh, different meetings because uh, you know look this is where this is where um, the commissioner of baseball is failing. He is not able to rally the owners to a singular idea he's basically taking the owner's idea and trying to say that it's the owner's way or no way and there's no negotiation there's no there's no give and take it's this is how it is or else and if you don't like it we're taking our toys and we're going somewhere else correct yeah Yeah. well yeah what was an owner induced lockout where baseball has only had um one uh stoppage in 90 in 95 that i think was considered a lockout where the other one i believe was in 92 i want to say i might be getting the history but i think that's what it was where it was a player strike because they came into the season um without a cba deal because they just wanted to get the season started but players threatened if they didn't get what they wanted they would strike and then they did and there didn't end up being a world series i'm pretty sure that was 92 but okay 
Uh, I could be wrong on that, but I'm 95% sure it was 92. But okay. that's pretty much all we got for baseball and the lockout talk right now. We hope it gets better as time goes on. <laughs> Sooner rather than later. Yes, ex- 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 <laughs> exactly. We hope it gets better as time goes on. Um, because... Obviously, we want to be able to see the season start in time, or we don't want to see those shortened seasons like we saw in the NHL, obviously. So we want to have an extended season that's the regular length and not the shortened lockout season that the NHL had while they were trying to have their exactly. CBA. Exactly, exactly. So, hey, you know, look, like I said, it's one of those things where we want to hear something sooner rather than later. Um, and as long as they follow that kind of path where, look, you have some time to kind of, I guess, try to negotiate. I mean, I guess that would be the word for it because they basically came out and said, here's the deal. So now the Players Association is going to counter that, right? And then there's going to be this back and forth now in the media with what the ownership is offering and what the players association is going to counter with. So that to me is mistake number one. No, exactly. I mean, I think it's just, it it goes back to what I said at the forefront. Like you made it like with all what you just said, they're they're doing, they're trying to get too much done um, at once in a where a CBA, I can't remember who made this point um, on MLB network, but they made the point of, you can't get everything done in one foul swoop of a CBA. That's why you amend CBAs over time and you put different things in. You just got to get done your like three, like you should have three key points for each side or something like that. Right. However many key points you want to have, no more than five, because then it gets too complicated. And then go with that and run with that. And then you can amend stuff as time goes on. And then it makes it a lot easier. But the problem here is, We've heard about the NHL at times as my closing point for this, being the most divided between the player association and league. That's now flipped to baseball. That clearly is the most divided between the players association and the league. And that's (laughs) not just on Rob Manfred to get together. That's on Tony Clark to get together on the players association. Exactly. Exactly. You know, not, not that the NHL, which is a perfect segue, not that the NHL is that terribly much better. But it has no, gotten... it's not. But they got it done, like we said. They got right. it done in turmoil time where right. they were trying to bring a season back during a freaking pandemic. <laughs> no, right. That's, That's what I mean. Then yeah, get a with... deal done for the CBA at the same time to extend the current one and then to review it then later. So, so now here we go, man. We're going to get into this now. And the first question I have to ask you is this. And I think. One of the first things I think we need to talk about right off the gate is the fact that the Flames game uh, was postponed this evening, and up until Thursday, their games have been postponed for the uh, Calgary Flames. Yep. Okay. The game against the uh, Blackhawks that was supposed to happen tonight has been postponed. That was the only game on the slate for tonight. Um, Now... I have this question here for you, Professor Joe, and we talked about this uh, on on almost every other show that I've done or that we've done or talked about. The fact that um, Ottawa had to get to 10, um, the Islanders got to 8, and now Calgary got to 6, five players with one staff member, okay, before the league stepped in. It seems like when it crosses over, they step in quicker. Like if it's staff with the, um, and not all the time, but I, th- I think, I think at this point it's just with the way it's getting in Alberta too. Because I'll read the, um, yeah, no, I read that thing. I saw um, somebody tweet if I can get it to pull up. Um, this guy said. He spoke to the infectious disease doctor from abound there where the uh, cases are doubling in Ontario every two to three days where they estimate there will be 10K daily cases by December 31st. So obviously Calgary and Edmonton are both in Ontario. We hope nothing happens with the Oilers um, either where they're saying that could lead to them 
postponing fan allowance at a certain point. Um, for the Calgary Flames and Edmonton Oilers, so we'll have to see how that goes. Um, but the, I, I feel like they did it, they ruled it for that as well, where when it came to the other teams, their areas were not in that much turmoil with the way that their cases were going. Um, at the same time of their team having those cases, they they had they had cases obviously around, but it wasn't like doubling, and then they were estimating a ridiculous 10K number by the end of December for these other areas like where Ottawa was um, and in um, St. Louis when they paused for a little bit. But like you have you have um, a weird way here because there's no legal structure basically in the league documents that they made when they came back from COVID of what the structure is like you guys talked about on the off the wall hockey show a couple weeks ago for when you should postpone and when you should wait like how many does it have to be? But I feel like this was the right decision due to the fact of how bad Alberta's doing right now as a whole. So you want to be safe and ge- you want to be safe in general when it comes to that. Where I'm usually one of those people where normally I would prefer that they do err on the side of caution. That's why I didn't mind that I didn't go to Reading on Saturday and they ended up canceling that due to Adirondack and Reading having. Uh, oh, yeah. issues with uh, okay. the COVID protocols. And then Carlos Domenico was isolated as the backup goaltender because of the way the COVID protocols were. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there was, there's actually been a lot of, uh, a lot of the AHL has been shutting down because of COVID protocol. They've had a lot of, uh, a lot of issues with the AHL, which uh, uh, we might be able to have time that we get into that later. But um, I, I am, I'm very disappointed in the NHL. I am one of those people that I do not have a problem to err on the side of caution. I have no problems with that. Okay. But what I have a problem with is that you have now presented three different, completely different scenarios where you've done the same action that you've done in all three different scenarios. Your action was the same, which was postpone games for said team. Okay. Yep. So no matter why they're doing it, it's how they look with what they're doing, okay? And to me, this is not a good look. You had one team had to go to 10, then another team who is a better team than Ottawa and the Islanders got to eight, and then they stepped in and did two games, right? And now Calgary, who's playing out of their bloody gourds, right? And now they got five guys, five players, and a staff member to six. And now the NHL steps in. Well, I think, I think, I think it just goes back to what we talked about, and you guys talked about on the show on Off the Wall, which is you should have had a legal, you should have had written structure in the league coming into the season. That's the one thing exactly they, they screwed up on um, when exactly. it came to the return, but. I mean, it, it is what it is. They could still, like, you're allowed to amend stuff, like we said. They could still try to put in some legal structure and uh, and do it that way. The, the, they're supposed to be, I saw a tweet, that there's supposed to be um, new guidelines coming out this week. So we'll see oh, now, uh, what, comes, now. Uh, what comes out in that. Well, they've been updating the guidelines throughout because I watched the uh, – Hockey guy a lot on uh, YouTube for his uh, COVID when he does his COVID like the videos where he talks about when they do the updates and like the breaking news yep. of like the update mm-hmm. videos because yes, he does a really good job with that. Good where, guy, man. Um, good guy. Yeah, where um they um talked about how they've updated it a couple times throughout the year. Where I think now they're probably going to make it a little bit stricter because you have places like Alberta that are starting to get it really bad and then i think toronto i remember seeing uh they they had their cases bare where luckily they didn't have a big issue with the big club there so uh hopefully the ahl can figure it out since they've had a lot of stuff a lot of their teams have come back um so hopefully that continues and they're not going to have as much issues going forward and then i saw cam york i think he was skating so he's on his roads back um from having it so uh things are pointing in the right direction hopefully Things can continue to do that, but we can move on now to a more um, upbeat topic for sure. Yes, which please. Is, 
uh, who is getting who is on the Canadian World Junior roster? Since for the U.S., it's only the preliminary thing that was announced, so there's no yeah. point at talking about it in deep depth yet because it's not the official roster. They're in their selection camp right now. Where right. for the Canadian roster, Elliot De Noyer, uh made it. <laughs> um, fifth round pick from the Flyers is absolutely killing it this far in his career. Where the most interesting thing. I remember about him uh, when it was on his scouting reports was how he's one of those players that will kind of like run through a brick wall, um, yeah. really has that high, like plays better. Like it, it actually said he plays better off the puck than on the puck because he'll just run and go to all the spots you want a guy to go to and not care, which you have to um, maybe be able to tone it down because you don't want him to be like Hughes where Jack Hughes is all the, now he doesn't have the same talent. Obviously he wasn't picked that high, but I'm saying, where he gets injured because of how much of a bulldog mentality he has. Like, you have to be able to balance that at the same time. That's why I brought him up. But I feel like throughout his career, like they said that when he got drafted, now he's great on the puck, too, and off the puck. He's still amazing. A good 200-foot player has skating speed. Obviously, you and Lance talked about it on Hockey Writers, Inc. We need more skating speed with the skill on this team. He has that. Um, So... I feel like now, since he's had 49 points in 37 last year, uh, 36 points already in 23 games this year, uh, he that obviously he deserved to make the World Junior roster. It's not common for guys always to be picked in the fifth round to make the World Junior roster, and he earned it. Um, I mean, th- this kid, I feel like, is definitely going to be one of the steals of the draft. Well, we also got Zaid Wisdom, of course, who's now back playing and about ready to play in the juniors. I think he might have played his first game yesterday, actually. Um, but he's um, down there with Kitchener again because he's only eligible to play down there. So we'll be yeah. able to see what he's hurt. able to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's a seems like he's a steal as well. De Noyer seems like a steal. So we'll be able to see. There's other guys overseas that look good, but we'll get into them in other episodes when we have more time to overall talk about them. But seeing Elliot De Noyer uh, do that well is very exciting for Flyers fans, I would hope. Um, the fact that um, the destroyer is captain of the uh, the team that he's on right now. Is it Moosehead? Halifax. Yeah. Halifax. Okay. The Moosehead. Halifax. Moosehead. Moosehead. Yeah. So is he the captain? The... I knew he was the A last year. I didn't even know he was a captain. Yeah, he's captain this year. He was oh, okay. he was elected captain this year. So that's the other thing too. So. Um, uh, yeah, really coming into his own, and I think he's going to be wearing the orange and black sooner rather than later, as far as I'm concerned. You yeah, he I mean? might be. He's um, right now. He's only 19. Uh, he, he, I feel like probably will get a little bit of AHL time when he comes up from the juniors, but I don't know if it'll be a 20 year old call, but maybe 20, 21. Which well, would then make. Okay, yeah, I, I, yeah, no, I got you, but let's face it, uh, Philadelphia is in a much different um, uh, journey now. Oh, I agree with that, but you know how much I'm like, I get pissed at teams for rushing people up. Oh, no, well, I'm not I, asking you to rush yeah, him. Yeah, I'm just saying yeah. that there's going to be a lot of pieces that are going to move in Philadelphia in the next coming months. Okay, let's just hope he's not one of them. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, well, I I don't think when you're a team that's retooling in the sense that I think the Flyers would retool to try to bring in more young talent, at least in my own opinion, because you're going to try to get guys that have a chance to get better longer. I don't think you're going to trade somebody like him. You'd be trading away guys more like you might even move Atkinson, even though you just brought him in, um, where you might even end up moving him. Uh, Uh You're obviously going to look to maybe even move a guy like, like Sandheim in or whatever from him. Uh, well, Risto, yeah, Risto would depend on if you want to resign him or not. Uh, if you don't want to resign him, you move on from them. If you want to resign him, you resign him. Right. Um, so you have to see what you want to do there because he's still at 20. I think he's 27. So he's still at that age where you definitely have a good amount of years left with him. Um, at least like probably five seasons that he's playing at a decent level. So, right. Um, that's the other thing. But the other thing we have to talk about, though, moving on from the Flyers so we don't get too in overly invested who are on a two-game winning streak now. And hey, try to... Sh- sh- and try to get out. 
try to get going against the Devils, who they lost to the last two tomorrow. Right. Um, right, right. But th- also, Bedard um, <laughs> making the Canadian World Junior roster. I know. At That's another good old. one. Yeah, Connor Bedard <laughs> makes it at 16 years old. Uh, obviously, is going to be one of the best players. And I believe uh, he's eligible in 2023. Yes. Yeah. Um, because that makes him 17. Yeah. Where in, Oh, no, yeah, wait, no, where, I'm sorry. 18. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you can so, be, you can be 17 if your birthday falls on or, you know what I mean? It's whatever that cutoff date is. He, he's he'll, Yeah. No, so exactly. He's, I, I agree. Cause Shane Wright is obviously the guy that's talked about the most this year. But Bedard's kind of one of those guys that's been talked about as a phenom. Similarly, through the rising ranks is another person that's from Canada that obviously still has his place in the offseason in Halifax. Yeah. That is a captain of a certain team in Pennsylvania that is not mm. or The way uh, to uh, <laughs> you. Men- mention any names uh, or anything. Um, Bless you. Sorry. So, <laughs> so um, he, he, he oh, has, that wasn't too yeah. subtle there, Pro Joe. I, 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 yeah, I, I, no, I don't, I don't like to put a lot of pressure on people, but he has been in that same phenom level at a young age, yeah. talked about, written about in the hockey writers and all these other magazines you can read. Um, so it, it has that level of like, oh my gosh, to it, where Shane Wright yeah. has that a little bit, but. He fell off a little bit when they have another guy. Well, but this draft, to me, even in 2022, where we'll get into it more in further shows when we have the time. But I like a lot of people in the draft and think it's actually like people like people that really dive into the draft that are like the draft like analysts. They talk about how it is a deeper draft. It's just you don't have in the draft next year. You just have the Connor Bedards of the world who are like I just said, Crosby like, well, like how it was as a team. Like everyone's talking about this dude at a different, so, completely different yeah. level. Where in this year's draft, you have guys that came on later, like Savoy, who really is getting better in his draft year. Um, Nemec's a great defenseman. Uh, Yurov's a good two way player. Um, and then you have Slavowski, who's a very good bigger center. So obviously, that's somebody that I wouldn't mind getting for the Flyers. A bigger center that can skate kind of reminds me of Vitaly Kratsov, but at center. Oh, gosh, um, no. So oh. that, that wouldn't be a guy oh. I would mind having. Um, so there's a lot of guys that I like in the draft, even if the Flyers end up do going on a run. Uh, there's even people later later in the draft, um, like Nathan Gaucher. Um, yeah. Or different people like that. Well, um, so you have um, a bunch of different people at that point. So I feel like this draft is not as good as the 2023 because the 2023 is supposed to be talked about as one of the best in a long time. But that's why people are saying it's not deep. They're saying it's not deep because it's compared to that next year's draft that's supposed to be one of the best like right. ever in most people's eyes. Right. You're, you're, anything's not going to be that deep. Right. See, that's what I was just going to say. And this this past year's draft wasn't that deep either. You know, the, well, the, that's in now's eyes. Though. That's why, like, I started doing the draft for pick reviews on my channel. Yeah. Um, for from the 2018 draft, because I feel like you have to wait three years where people were saying that now three years into the future, we might be going, oh, my gosh, look at the fifth round picks that have turned out. Look at the fourth round picks. Look at the sixth. Uh, see, yeah, picks. exactly. Guys exactly. That have started to really come in and look like they're either at, right in the cusp of getting caught up or just murdering the AHL where they're right. eventually going to be caught up and that team has a deep roster or they're exactly. lightning that way to your 23 half of the time, unless if you're the goat to get caught up. So, like, there was no problem with that because it's there's no problem waiting to a guy's fully right. – like the closest, closest to being ready for his call because you're never 100%. But that's just a different strategy than some teams use. But no, uh, De Noyer and um, Bedard, obviously we wish them all the best on the Canadian World Junior roster. The uh, rest of it is Maverick Bjork, who's with Dallas, Willie Coley, um, Ridley Craig, uh, Dylan Gunther, Kent Johnson, McTavish, Neighbors, Perfetti, sort of. McTavish, Perfetti, yeah. yeah. He's the yeah they they have a loaded team Lucas yeah. Corp, Shane Wright oh Logan, man uh Justin Sordiff 
uh, Ryan Oldworth, Carson Lambos, Caden Gooley, Owen Power, Donovan Sobranco. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Owen Zealander, and then oh. the the most experienced is uh, Colsa and um, Gerard, who I didn't even see. Good over. gravy! So as long as this uh, wow is accurate from. The guy from Sporting News, Jake Alfarot, I guess is how you say that. Then that's most of their uh, their roster right there. So um, this wow. is set to start from the 26th, go through January 5th, the World Juniors. For yeah. people who are interested. So that's just the review of the Canadian team as now. Uh, we can love watching that series, man. I also like watching the uh, international the IIHF as well, too. I love watching those international series as well, too, uh, with the hockey teams. So uh, especially uh, going to be tuned into the juniors. Uh, well, that's what this is, the IIHF World Junior. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh. So uh, really, I really um, – that is – that to me is invaluable when it comes to getting a good look at these young players. Um, and especially – uh, like if you look at the young players that were successful during the junior championships, they usually tend to be successful at the next level, you know, at the NHL level. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm just saying that it translates really well. If you tend to have a good uh, world juniors, you can tend to either get time, get a higher draft pick. Your your draft draft stock goes up a little bit. You you know what I mean? Guys that usually stand out during those juniors uh, championships usually end up being you know future stars of the NHL anyway. I mean you know seriously, let's face it, that's basically how it boils down, right? <laughs> that's what they're doing it for. So come on. <laughs> but um really excited to see that coming um and seeing i i can't wait to see what the united states team is going to look like um that team as well i think is going to be oh yeah pre- no, pretty stacked the most stacked teams they had in a while coming off of an exciting win last year yeah. in canada against canada so uh yeah, you, you can't uh, beat a rival in an any better fashion there. Um, and especially so, when you're able to put up as as good of a roster, uh, a who's who of of American talent that is just as going to be just as good as the Canadian team, I think, in my opinion. Uh, yeah. No, no, yeah. It's going to be close again. I feel like though both of those teams have a fight, uh, fantastic fighting chance. Uh, Yep. Yeah, I was going to say a fighting chance. That's what I was looking for, to get to get to the finals again. Yes, but sir. another thing we want to talk about in the positive uh, run of things is how good Charlie Lindgren did after having a great AHL career. Charlie Lindgren has come up now, and he's 3-0, and 1.42, 9.47 save percentage. Pirlo and I were talking about it on his show. Um, he's just one of those guys you root for. And then Gilly's had a good game yesterday yeah. for them as well, who was who was fun to watch, uh, big as heck, could barely see over him from behind the net. <laughs> the but um, but you have uh, Charlie Lindgren, who's much smaller, easier to see over at 6'1", 182. Mm-hmm. Has been very good with the uh, Rocket in his career in the minors, and now this year was great with the Thunderbird, one of the AHL's best uh, with a 925 save percentage. So – uh, he deserved the call up. Obviously, it was because of Huso going down and Bennington being on the COVID protocol. But now they know they have a fantastic, which I think they knew already from how he was doing in the A. Yeah, 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 yeah. But now they know they, for sure, they have a guy that's really found it and is able to do it at the NHL level, too, which was the only question you had because he wasn't able to do that really in Montreal, minus the OK stretch he had in a couple games in the 17 18 season. Otherwise, he wasn't really able to do it in Montreal. So um, I think this kid now has a well, – he's not right. He's 27. I think he has a chance to be able to find it and be maybe one of those guys that becomes a backup now around the league with somebody else. Because if you stay that hot, uh, you're definitely going to get noticed. Not necessarily to be traded now, but when you're on the market again, which I think is after the season for Lindgren. So you're going to be noticed potentially as a potential backup for teams. So. At- Point, so let me throw a sick number at you here, okay? Right? So they had him called up, right? 
to come and fill in, right, to play three games, Charlie Lindgren, right? Correct. Yeah. In those three games, <laughs> he he won all three of those games. He only had to stop 57. He only faced 57 shots in three games. Oh, yeah, but Ruby's team plays a very good defensive. Um, I mean, eight, he only eight, let eight, one goal in for on each one of them games. Yeah, no, they de- they defend you really well, which is exactly what um teams like when you saw Rick Taka's structure in um Arizona when Dawson Kemper was successful was because they kept people to the outside. Well, that was a different structure, but there's different defensive structures where the Blues – uh, use the one that's a little bit not oftenly used anymore, which is the try to just get in the face of the opponent and frustrate them and then uh, push the uh, offense up the ice and get it going that way, where um, only a couple teams really use that. The Bruins are obviously a team that have always kind of used that strategy. I'm um, with you, but I mean, when you look at a guy that's only faced 57 shots, in three games, that's not even that's not even twenty shots a game for the opposition. <laughs> I'm oh, yeah. sorry. No, yeah, but the Blues also obviously we talked about it pre-show. The only thing they need to figure out, uh, they lost a tough one in overtime, but it got them a point. So they got to figure out how to play on the road more successfully because that's what's yeah. holding them. If they can yeah, get their record to be good compared to mediocre and then have that really good home record, they have a chance to be one of the best in the West. Yeah, um, sure. So, yeah, they just need to keep building and yep. growing from yep, yep. that. And but they the will. Next, I think they will. I think they will. Mm-hmm. Where the next yeah. thing uh, we wanted to talk about was how hot a former prospect, uh, now a current NHL or with the Nashville Predators, Ellie Tolvin was, who was on a four game goal streak. Um, before last game, when then another fellow youngster, Philip Tomasino, uh, picked up the scoring to be able to beat the Rangers. So uh, you have Tolvanen, who has always been a very um, smart player when it comes to picking out the play, passing the puck, obviously a good skater. I think he was a guy that also benefited from getting a chance to go back to the KHL and play for Jokerid, who he played for back before he came over here. Uh, because of the uh, season when when we didn't have when we had a stopgap in the season, he played twenty five right. games, got points. So he got to play in the men's league over there after only having a total of seven games in the NHL before that. So right. I think that really helped him. He came back here to pretty solid, not defensively, but offensively with twenty two points in forty games. Then this year he's playing much better on both ends. Um, had a four-game goal streak that really got him going, but his possession numbers are ridiculous. He's a very good puck possession player, a guy that's able to exit the zones efficiently, which he was with the Flyers. Moving on, um, a guy that's able to exit the zone efficiently. Hey, we can dream. And, and um, he uh, he's one of those quicker skaters where, yes, he's not the biggest in size at 5'10", 190, but when you have the skill and you have the possession ability that he has – being good on the puck and being good on your stick. I heard Biz and different people talk about this. Um, Paul Bizanet and like Whitney and different people talk about it. It's not necessarily how big you are. It's how strong your hands are and how strong you're able to really control getting hit or hit around and getting like stick checked and everything. If you have really strong wrists and hands and you're able to do a good job at that. And if you work on it really hard, you're going to be able to do it. I mean, uh, Tolvanen's a guy that has very good um, p- possession numbers and seems like a guy that's just on the cusp. He's only 22 years old. He's really starting to figure it out this season, where last year he did solid offensively, but this season he's kind of figuring out more in all facets. Right. No, I mean, I, I've been very impressed, um, especially with uh, the age and, and how he's coming through. Uh it's always amazing when you see these guys, you know what I mean? Uh, when they, when they finally start to get it figured out and it just goes to show you, um, how much of, um, importance it is to the core of a hockey player, the strength of the core of the hockey player. You know, when you, you talked about it with the, with being able to hold on to the stick, 
right? And and being able to be strong on your stick. Okay, that's good, strong, crisp passes. That's receiving good, strong, crisp passes. You know, that's being responsible on both ends of the ice. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so I, I really like that kind of aspect and, and to see players who finally get to start figuring that out. You know what I mean? Um, that, that to me, that I like seeing it. That's why I like to watch a lot of the, the um, uh, especially the juniors and, 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 you know, the, uh, 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 all the, uh, the lower leagues and stuff like that. I like to watch and keep tabs on that stuff because that's the next generation. That's the next group of, talent that's going to be coming up so you know it's it's always good to be paying attention to what's going on with those guys no yeah i completely agree where our last topic as we're here at the quarter ish mark most teams are between 25 to 30 games in the nhl yeah yes yeah, uh, like we're going to check in on the stat leaders right now which the problem with edmonton of course ain't the offense you have two of the uh, high, two of the guys tied for the points lead right now in McDavid and Dreisaitl with 45 is the fact that you got to get that defense to get figured out. Um, and then, but yeah. those guys, yeah, those guys are tied at the top at 45. Ovechkin's right behind them at 44, and then it's a 10 point drop off to fourth place. Which like, is not Padre, who's having a great season, yeah, uh, but... gonna get a payday if he keeps having this season. Um, he's at like for over, well, well over a points per game pace in 22, way over it, but he's just not at the level of those elite of the elite guys All right, so, right up there. Okay, I'm with you. I'll, I'll put it in perspective for you. I'll put it in perspective for you. Ovechkin is 1.57 goals per game, right? Yeah. And, one of the and, and Nazem Kadri is 1.55. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he's having a heck of a season. It's yeah, wise. Um, he's just not all the way up there with those guys. But that's how the points get out for the top five, where we are in points, where yeah. goals. Big David, even though he's tied with Drysaddle in points, is not there in goals. Uh, he has wow. sixteen, which is eighth. Leon Drysaddle leads the league with twenty-three, which is three above Alexander Ovechkin. Um, and Leon Dreisaitl obviously is a guy that still sometimes people don't appreciate just how filthy he is because he's on a team with a guy that obviously is the best in the land right now when it comes to hockey, which is Connor McDavid. So uh, that that makes it a little bit hard to be the most recognized guy. But then you have Kyle Connor. He was fifth in points, third in goals at 18. Austin Matthews tied with him at 18. And then you have Terry and Kreider and Majiapani tied um, at 17. So that's how it shakes out um, in this one where Kreider's playing to be the captain of the um, Rangers, it seems like. And then Troy Terry's playing like a guy that's looking like a potential future, very good all-star level player at the very least uh, for the Anaheim Ducks that they got in the fifth round. So that's looking like a steal. And then, yeah. of course, that's... Zegris out there, uh, come to us when healthy steel. You got all these other young guys out Man. there. That's going to be a fun team. McTavish when he's actually back and playing for the Ducks. Um, so you have a great team there. And we know after the junior season, he'll probably get more time with the Ducks. So uh, once the junior season wraps up next year. So I feel like um, the, that team is set to just keep moving in the right direction where they're ahead of where they thought they would be being a surprise team this season. So they're definitely moving steps in the right direction when it comes to their club. I'm with you on that. Um, The Troy Terry uh, with Anaheim was quite um, a nice little run there. He had 18 game uh, point streak there that he was on. So that was amazing. And as he went, so did the Ducks. And they have just, their game has definitely elevated this year. Yep. Okay. Him and goal- Zegers make a huge difference. Oh my That's gosh! Cool. And then you throw, yeah. you, you sprinkle in some some Gibson goaltending in there, and hey, hey that's a, and then a former Flyers, a, a former Flyers prospect that only got held back from his injuries is now a very good backup to Gibson is Stolars. Stolars, yeah, I was just gonna say, <laughs> like, all right, <laughs> uh, no, but this year has been a little bit 
different because you're starting to see some of the other guys start to take over now. You know, I mean, yeah, you're going to have the McDavid's, you're going to have the Ovechkin's, but you're you're starting to see the other guys, the Matthews, the Connors, the Criders, the Mangiapanis, the Terrys, the, you know what I mean? The, that kind of stuff. So it, no matter what, Mikel th- Gronlin, because he's sixth in assists, and yeah. he's like above, well above a point. He's like above, or yeah, he's a couple above a points per game pace. So exactly yeah, he's going ridiculous and ballistic out there in Nashville. So, and I'm I have to say, of all of those guys, I'm probably the most impressed with Kadri. Yeah, yeah, because he's a guy that also, on top of, like, the stats show some things. Like, my one good friend always says the stats are just one point of evidence. Uh, yes. Where you can't just go by the analytics and you can't just go by the stats. It's something to use that is good things to use, but then you have to see what you see. Where he's playing much more discipline, which is therefore leading to him playing as good of a game as he's playing this exactly. year. Exactly. Where, um, when you see also in Colorado, it seems like Bednor has not getting out of the mindset that we put him in here that Lance was talking about. And people that want to know, check out the Hockey Writers Inc. show about what he talked about. But yeah. he's a little bit more disciplined minus the stupid penalty <laughs> it took against us. Uh, but yeah. uh, he's playing a little bit more disciplined out there and playing better, getting some goals. So I, I feel like when it comes to him, he's in a contract year two. That's always an extra motivator. So we'll exactly. have to see what he's able to yeah. continue to do. But he really picked it up and was a saving grace for them when uh, Nathan McKinnon was injured. Yeah, no, I mean, that that really was – I think that was the difference. And I think that's one of the things that kind of put him over the edge where, okay, we got a player in this guy. You know what I mean? This guy is the real deal here. And he made – he made a decision hard for the coaches to send him back. You know what I mean? So that that's I love those stories. I love players like that. I love hearing about players like that. Oh yeah, because he's a guy when he played bad, Bednar would move him down the lineup. Yeah, like send him down third, like give him exactly. lesser minutes because he wanted him to do what he was doing. He probably knew he had more skill in, in his tape and was able to get it going. And then he didn't know, I think, to this oomph degree because he hasn't shown that in the rest of his career. But he knew he had more there, and you're really yep. seeing it this year. Exactly, exactly. And you know what? Um, you got any other last little quick things here to say the, to wrap the, up the about quick, NHL? The quick thing about hockey we have to get into, too. Two big reasons the Rangers are over there are Temi Panarin and Adam Fox, second in assistant oh, yeah. Fox, uh, fourth for Panarin, who's tied with aforementioned Nazim Kadri, and then also tied for the next spot is Kaprizov, Huberdo, Hedman, and Gronland, as well as Leon Dreisaitl. Uh, so, yeah. obviously, Panarin, Fox, huge parts of that Rangers team, as well as Lafreniere and Kako, um, who's yeah. going to continue to get better if those guys can stay healthy. Man, and that's then you just have a nice... Lindgren, who's a very good defensive defenseman yep. on that team. And then watch out for Jacob Truba if you're on the ice. Um, so, <laughs> Especially uh, if you're not looking up. Yeah, so be be aware of Jake. Um so and not Jake from State Farm. So yeah, this one here is a Truba. He's wearing a a, a a license plate that says New York Rangers. He's 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 the truck that's dressed like a New York Ranger. Yeah, man, that was just you know I'm that was one that the NHL got right. That was to me, as far as I'm concerned, was not an illegal hit. He didn't. Leave his skates. He didn't like lead with his elbow or his shoulder or anything like that. You know what I mean? It's just like dude turned around and he was right there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you also obviously the first thing you're taught um, where I never played ice hockey at a high level. I only played roller hockey with people when we were able to play. But the first thing you just watch in videos when you watch those hockey one on one things is you got to keep your head up. But I don't think it was a dirty thing, but now we should, so we can get into it, move into the NFL, where first we'll start with uh, an interesting thing and then go into something that is negative. But we have Mika Parsons um, quoted saying, I don't really think the NFL is hard. (laughs) Um, The full quote says, I don't think the NFL is hard. I think they got some really great players around here. 
but I just think it's a bunch of players that work really hard, and I think it rubs off whenever you play guys like Lyle, meaning Lyle Collins, um, in practice. So um, I think uh, that's an interesting quote. I mean, I feel like that's more of a competitive edge quote than him being – because you see it with Parsons. He's one of those high-energy like guys that – can play linebacker or play DN, and he's going to find a way to get to your quarterback no matter where he's playing. That's why a lot of people thought that he should have been, like, for example, by the Eagles, but they did end up getting a good pick or should have been drafted by many teams that needed defensive help that were not just the Dallas Cowboys and that needed to fall into the Dallas Cowboys. Um, So he's a heck of a player. Preach it, brother. <laughs> uh, yeah, so he's a heck of a he'd look good in black and gold, too. Yeah, he's a heck of a player. I usually don't mind guys kind of coming out of their shell to say stuff like this, so I'm just going to roll with what I normally say, and it is what it is. If you want to be that outgoing about how you feel and be that outgoing, people are going to be coming for you more now, but he has the talent to take on whoever is coming for him on the offensive line of the opposing team. So, All right, so now um, I've, I've got to watch uh, Micah Parsons' um, – play high school ball i got to oh, watch really? him oh, okay. yeah mm-hmm. he's from where i'm from close by he's he's not far from where i'm from okay and so i got to watch him play high school ball and he was the best athlete out there on the field <laughs> hands down hands down when he was on the field he was the best athlete out there and when he got to penn state and then i got to watch him play at penn state and for the most part, he was the best defensive player at Penn State when he was there. Now, I think the thing that hurt him was that he sat out for the COVID year. Okay. And uh, that's still, he still got drafted by the Cowboys. He's still going to bank. He's still a freaking phenomenal player as long as he stays healthy. He's he's going to be a, a great player. That's just it. He's one of those types of guys, like you said, Joe, where he's tenacious and he's not going to let something stop him or get in his way. And I like it when guys come out and honestly tell you what they think and feel about what's going on in the league that they're playing in. Yeah, no, I don't mind it at all. I think it's more he just is, knows how confident he is in his game. And that's really what that shows there. But uh, moving now from a positive, uh, fun thing from Parsons into something that's negative, the NFL unfortunately had 37 COVID positive tests across the league, setting their single day high. Um, that came in on Monday as we're recording this on Monday, December 13th, where prominent people for tonight's game were Jalen Ramsey and Tyler Higby, who will not be available to play yep. against the Cardinals. Um, yep. For the Rams, other people were Miami Dolphins, Philip Lindsay. Um, and safety, Javon Hollard, um, Chargers tackle, Rashawn Slater, Cowboys receiver, Wilson, Cedric Wilson, Kansas City Chiefs receiver, who I forgot from the Chiefs, Josh Gordon, uh, New York yeah. Giants receiver, Kadarius Toney. And then there's a, a additionally a tier three staff member of the Washington football team. So yeah, that that's uh, how it is there. That's unfortunate. Hopefully they're able to get that figured out. But that's just some quick breaking news. Um, to get out so people know that haven't seen it on their apps or what have right, you. Right, right. Well, listen, man. Let's since since we have uh, since we we covered the bad and the and the good. Let's let's cover the game. Right, the bad, the good, and the game. So there's a game tonight, and it's actually going to be a pretty darn good game. I think. I mean, what do you think? Right, the Rams uh, and the Cardinals. It, the I feel like. With Jalen Ramsey being the big impact player he is, it's in Arizona. Him being out, yeah. uh, he being a very good uh, tight end that also blocks significantly solid. So I think, and obviously catches it well from Stafford, I don't think the Rams have been as impressive the last couple weeks. They're only two and three in their last five. So yeah. I feel like I'm going to definitely be leaning Cardinals in this game. Uh, and especially even without – um, Kyler Murray, they were still able to take care of business with McCoy in as their backup. So, I mean, uh, man, Arizona looking like the real deal this year. What, what are they, 10 and 2? 10 and 2, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, the Rams are 8 and 4. Right. 
So I think this is actually going to be – I do agree, though. The Rams haven't looked that good over the last couple of weeks, uh, but still 10-3 and three over the last five. Um, and and, uh, and uh, Arizona has been playing very, very well. Um, so I, I do agree, though. I, I, I am going to be leaning more Arizona yeah, on this. Arizona's only piss-poor game um, was against Carolina, which was a game in which Colt McCoy started and didn't right. – so if Kyler Murray was in that game, I don't think they would have got spanked by Carolina. Exactly. And then the second game that he started, right, he was had almost the most perfect quarterback rating. Like he only missed like one or two passes out of like 30 some passes yeah, or something crazy. Seals. Yeah, he, he, yeah. He 35 for 44. He did really good against <laughs> the Seattle. So, um, but yeah, he, he bounced back. But yeah, that one loss was with their backup quarterback. So I don't really... Um, yeah, look, you know, went in there all too much, and then their other loss was against the Packers, which was with Kyler. But the Packers are a great team as well, who they just have to hope Rogers Co doesn't harm them from being able to go as deep into the season as they can. That's the yeah, only yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you on that one for sure. And that was a good game. Yeah, bounce back and be better than their mediocrity of late. Me to exactly. hope Josh Allen is not injured for something that affects him. Where we've seen in a walking boot after the loss, and for the Ravens' success is our last point for the NFL. Lamar Jackson had an ankle sprain. We saw Jalen Hurts have to miss time for that a week, and then had the bye week though. So would he have to have missed two weeks without the bye week? Nobody would ever know. Uh, we'll have to see how that's going to affect Lamar. Though. I did see. I did see though um, an article saying that Harbaugh does expect. Jackson to be starter for this coming week. So did uh, Nick Sirianni. So that could just be the coaching tactic. Uh, I will have to see because sometimes coaches like having the tactic of I don't want the opponent to know in the until the last minute. So you have to game plan for two people, and then it kind of throws your system out of whack. Yeah. So yeah. that you say it where that's what Sirianni did. It was basically until the day of game day almost. It might have been the night before, but we didn't know Jalen right. not start. Yeah. And you had like Minshew taking snaps. There was inklings of it, but there was no announcement until right before practically. So just to be clear, though, we both are going with Arizona on this Monday night game. Arizona, yeah. 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 Especially with the two big losses for the Rams uh, coming in. Exactly. So I think maybe it's going to be more of a a higher scoring game for Arizona than it is going to be for um, the Rams, I think, for this game. So, yeah. yeah. So, all right, cool. To wrap up our show, we're actually going to, for the first time in the fourth installment, since we're at the quarter mark, 25 to 30 games in this league as well in the NBA. We're going to give you some of the stats leaders where the points, the highest points per game guy is someone that doesn't care about age either, just like Alexander Ovechkin. In hockey. <laughs> and that is Kevin Durant, who's 33. I mean, what? Leading the league in points per game at 29. He also has a 7.6 assists, 5.6 rebounds. So he's having a great overall season, shooting 38%, over 38% from uh, three and over 50% from the field. So like, he's shooting absolutely fantastic overall. And then obviously for the Golden State Warriors, uh, the Steph Curry, everybody knows and loves, is back in full effect. 6.3 assists, 5.6 rebounds, and 27 points at 40.404% from three and 43% from the field. So he's having a good overall season as well. And then Giannis Atetokounmpo is shooting over 50% from the field as well. Not the best three-point shooter, but he actually takes the shots. So you give him credit for that. So it makes oh, yeah. people, uh, since he takes the shots, the pump fake makes people accountable. And a dude that's 6'11 and that freak of an athlete, uh, it, once he drives to the um, once he drives to the rack, good luck stopping him once he's driving to to the basket. There's not there's not a good chance of of doing that, right. where the other guy is the MVP, Jokic. That's no surprise that he's in fourth. And then Trey Young, who's an absolute shooter, a killer of a shot. Uh, no surprise that he's tied for fourth with Jokic when it comes to points. Well, yeah. So I mean, um, boy, you got some uh, who's who here in the top. And with being at the quarter mark, is there any team? Look, I know that they've been. Um, some teams have had some guys in and out either on COVID or injuries or whatever the case is. And I know that last year there was a lot of 
players that missed a lot of time, especially uh, for the California teams. Um, you know what I mean? So is everybody back and healthy? I mean, I know we're at the quarter mark now for no, the there's NBA. Still, but... There's still people out with COVID for teams. It's like every other league. There's been people going in and out of the lineups for different teams, just okay. like the NFL and NHL. It's, it, it's the same thing. There, there's been people going in and out. Um, so Did they you, mandate for them to have the vaccine. All players have to have vaccine and all that. No, well, I'm, no, I'm 95 percent sure the NBA has not done that. Um, just like the NFL, I don't think it's done that. Either. No, the NFL did. The NFL well, the NFL did. did if you want to have a social life, but if you don't mind just living inside your home, then you could just say that I'm going to be having my own locker basically, and then play the game and then not be around my teammates again afterwards. And the, which would be a weird dynamic for you, but it, it would, it would, I think be allowed under the guidelines. Um, but when okay. we get to positive things to wrap up, one of my favorite players in the NBA that's still doing it uh, for the new Orleans or not the new Orleans, the um, Phoenix um, Suns is Chris Paul, who is just killing it assist wise, 10.2. He's easily going to assist. He's not the same goal scorer he used to be, or not goal scorer, um, point scorer he used to be. He was thinking of hockey. Uh, he only has a little bit over 14 points. But he's one of those guys that is a playoff performer, a guy that turns it on. Where last year I was so annoyed at uh, Simmons, who I don't need to get into, Ben Simmons, but right. he'll be here till next Christmas. But uh, I didn't watch basketball <laughs> after he didn't take that shot over Trey Young. But I once know. I saw how Chris Paul was doing in the finals, I did turn it on. So he's one of those player performers. James Harden, who's running it really well, running the offense well in Brooklyn, along with KD, his former teammate from Oklahoma City. Yep. Nine points in second. And then Trey Young, who's also top in the league in scoring in the top five at four is third with assists at 9.5, combining really well. With Russ, who's doing very good assist-wise, uh, he's fifth. He does need to pick it up, though, in terms of overall numbers. He's averaging – his stats are kind of deceiving because he's averaging 19.5 and shooting 45% from the field, but he, he doesn't – he he still needs to figure out the perfect way to fit into the Lakers lineup. That's a, that's a way to gotcha. put it. Where yeah. Doncic is 8.5. Uh, right ahead of Westbrook. So I think that pretty much, though, wraps us up um, for today as we thank you for joining for the fourth edition of the JB and Steel Show. Yeah, uh, for Steel Flyers that you can find over at steelflyers.com as well as it's just at Steel Flyers on Twitter, right? Uh, it's Steel Flyers 52, at Steel Flyers 52 yeah. on Twitter. At Steel Flyers 52 on Twitter. He still flyers. I'm Joe Borick. You can find me at JJ Borick 26 on Twitter. Articles on Flyers Nitty Gritty. And also, of course, over at Steel Flyers as well. We hope you all have a great, safe, and pleasant day. Are having a good holiday season and enjoy the rest of the great sports season. Take care, folks, and we'll see you next time on the JB and Steel Show. <laughs>